Good afternoon, my name is Dustin Spinhurd and I'm one of the cloud services architects with VMware. Uh, this is the first in a multi-part series designed to cover the concepts and architecture of VMware Cloud on AWS. In this session, we're going to uh, discuss the basic concepts of the customer-owned Amazon accounts, uh, the cloud services organization, the software-defined data center, and then how those SDBCs actually connect to Amazon services. So the first topic we want to discuss is the customer-owned Amazon account. So one of the major value propositions of this service is that uh, we are deployed directly in Amazon facilities, and so therefore we wanted to be able to provide our SDBCs with access to uh, Amazon services. However, we didn't want to become the billing entity for that, uh, for that process. And so the first prerequisite to getting started is that you have your own customer-owned Amazon account. And this account is where all of the Amazon services will reside. Our SDBCs will then sit off to the side and actually attach into this Amazon account. So one key, key point is that the SDBCs are not deployed within this account. The SDBCs are actually deployed in a VMware-owned Amazon account, and we're simply just linking into your Amazon account. So the cloud services organization, uh, this can be thought of as this top-level box that owns SDBCs, essentially. So within the VMware cloud uh, services console, we will have these orgs. Um, now, within the, the console, there are users. Uh, users can be associated with one or more of these orgs, and the orgs then, of course, contain the SDBCs. Now, on the topic of users, there are a couple of different types of users. So we've got at the base layer, we've got this org user. The org user basically has the, uh, the permissions to uh, manage these SDBCs. Um, they also have access to the other cloud services. You can set uh, sp uh, specific permissions on these users. Uh, per service, essentially. Now, the second layer of, uh, or second type of uh, user we have is this org owner. The org owner, essentially very similar to the org user other than they have the additional permission of managing these users. Now, when we first kick off the, uh, the process, uh, when you first go to activate the service, there's gonna be the special user known as a fund owner. So this fund owner, uh, they are going to be a special person uh, that, like I said, kicks off the process. Now, this person is going to have a My VMware profile, and or, or My VMware account, excuse me. And this uh, and this My VMware account is number one going to have funding associated with it. Uh, this funding is going to be how we actually pay for all these cloud services. Uh, then the next thing that this person wants to do is make sure that they have a profile in this account. This profile is completely fi uh, filled in. So there's uh, certain required fields uh, in these profiles. So you want to go back and review those and make sure that all of those are, are filled in. If any of those are missing, then it tends to cause the activation to fail. Now, when we go to actually uh, spin off the process or kick off the process to, to create an org, that's done by sending out an activation email. And that, that activation email is sent to the email address that's in this profile. So we want to make sure that this is an email address that's going to a person that, that knows what to do with it. Uh, we also want to make sure that, you know, sometimes these get uh, caught up in spam filters. So if, if you haven't received yours, it, that, that could be why. Now, inside of this email, there's going to be a single-use activation link. And clicking that link is what actually starts the process to create one of these orgs. Now, when this org is created, this fund owner will end, end up being added as an org owner, and then it's going to be their responsibility to go through in the portal and add the other users. Now, the software-defined uh, data center, this is a collection of bare metal hosts that are dedicated per the SDDC. And so what an SDDC looks like, we've got at the base layer, we've got the physical hardware, which is managed by Amazon. Uh, on top of that, um, when you deploy an SDDC, you'll specify the number of hosts that you want in the SDDC. You can come in, of course, later and add more hosts if you want. Uh, so on top of that, uh, when we first kick it off, we will install ESX and then vCenter, vSAN, and NSX. And then on top of this infrastructure, you will deploy your, your compute VMs. Now, this is a managed service, like I said, Amazon is managing the hardware and facilities. VMware is managing the software stack, and so we're doing all the upgrades. Uh, so period uh, periodically, we'll go through and we'll upgrade the SDBCs. And these, you know, we typically are running the the latest and greatest, so much newer versions uh, than what you're running on prem typically. And so, as part of this, because it's a managed service, um, there's a segregated permissions model, and so. Essentially, there's this cloud admin role and an associated cloud admin user that's a member of this role. Um, this cloud admin role has enough permissions to manage the workloads and has partial access to the infrastructure. So you can get into vCenter, 
v, you know, configure vSAN and then configure NSX and you can get into the UIs and APIs of both of these. What you can't do is admin level tasks within the SDC. So I can't, for example, log in uh, directly to the ESX host. I can't go into vCenter and try to delete hosts or add hosts that way. And so that's, that's where the uh, permissions restrictions come into play. And so typically this, uh, this level of uh, permission is enough for you to manage the day-to-day -day operations. Um, where it becomes potentially an issue is if you have some third-party application that you're trying to install, and if that third-party application requires admin level rights, or maybe it requires uh, access to the to the uh, root of a data store that you don't have permission to, that's where it becomes a problem. And so, um, you know, outside of that, uh, this is typically enough for people to manage their their day-to-day -day operations. So, connection to Amazon services. So, let's discuss how we are actually uh, tying these SDDCs into um, into the Amazon services and providing them access. And so, like I said, the SDDCs are, uh, these are provisioned within a, a you know, a, a, a an org in the VMware cloud uh, service. These orgs, uh, you know, essentially are, uh, you know, associated with Amazon accounts that are owned by VMware. So the, the SDDCs, in essence, reside in, VMware owned Amazon account and we want to connect these into your Amazon account and so let's walk through what that looks like and I'll discuss that uh, within the confines of actually deploying an SDDC and so let's assume you've kicked off uh, the VMC org um, you've got that there the the next thing you want to do is go through and spin off an SDDC create an SDDC and so um, the first time through, we're going to notice that you haven't linked to a customer, uh, to an Amazon account previously. And so one of the first things we'll do is go through that process. And so that process involves you logging into your Amazon account. So you open up another tab in, a, in the browser, log into that Amazon account. We typically tell people to do this with a, an admin level uh, user. You don't strictly need that where, you know, essentially what we're going to do is there's going to be a button in the VMC portal that says, you know, do account linking. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to execute a cloud formation template on the back end. And this cloud formation template runs as the user that's logged into the Amazon account. And so this user needs to just have enough permissions to execute this cloud formation template. And you can get a copy of this uh, if you want to take a look at it, uh, you know, request it from your CSM or, you know, through the, through the live chat and uh, they could potentially point you in the right direction to get that. Now this, once you, click that button, it executes this cloud formation template. That cloud formation template then creates a couple of roles in your Amazon account that essentially gives us enough permissions to manage this uh, cross-linking that we're gonna do. And so once you've gone through, this takes a, a minute or so, once it's, once it's executed and done its thing, the VMC org is now considered linked to this Amazon account. And so now you can continue down through the process. And so the next step is going to be for you to, uh, you know, you, you've determined a region that you want to deploy the SDDC. And so the next step is, uh, you know, comes to the next prereq, which is that you have a VPC for us to cross-link to. And so in that region, you're going to have a VPC. Now within that VPC, you're going to create a, <clears throat> a cross-link subnet for us. And we typically recommend a slash 26 at minimum for this. And we like to have this dedicated for this purpose. So we're going to do a bunch of, we're going to be linking a bunch of things in here. We want to make sure we, we, you know, we have enough space in the subnet. So we don't want other stuff sitting in the subnet. So try to give us a dedicated slash 26. Now, the other thing that you want to note is the AZ of the subnet. So this AZ is what you're gonna use you know, to control the placement of the SDDC. So essentially, whatever AZ this subnet is associated with is gonna be the AZ where we actually provision the SDDC. And so going back down through the process, you will have chosen this VPC, you will have already created this subnet, so you will select that from the UI. And by the way, we can read this stuff from your account because you've given us permissions to buy these roles. Uh, the, the final step is that you will provide a management IP range for the SDDC itself. So that's the final prerequisite to getting started. You, we need some management address space to use for the infrastructure of the SDDC. And we typically say, um, you know, slash 20 is what typically people are using um, because that, that allows for expansion growth in the SDDC. Um, you know, we, we also want this, um, you know, this subnet that you're gonna give us to be unique within your environment. So you wanna make sure that it's not conflicting with something in your on-prem environment. It's not conflicting with anything in the uh, your existing Amazon infrastructure. 
because we're going to be remember connecting to these SDBCs uh, via you know externally. Also, we're going to be cross-linking, so we want to make sure that none of the none of the address space we're using ever conflicts with anything. So once you provide us this management address space, you're going to hit the deploy button. Uh, it's going to go off and do its thing for a couple hours. At the end, you're going to end up with an SDDC. So the number of hosts you specified sitting in this AZ that you specified by this crosslink subnet. So crosslinking itself, um, what that looks like is literally like this. We, we create a series of ENIs. These ENIs are attached to this subnet. And these ENIs essentially tie back directly to these ESX hosts. And so we have a, a forwarding path between the SDDC and the VPC. And so this forwarding path is how we actually access the Amazon services. And so this is the cross-linking that I was referring to. And so again, this is why we want this dedicated subnet because we're, you know, in addition to the, the ENIs that you see here, there's also going to be a bunch of additional ones for expansion and upgrades, things like that. So we will use quite a bit of these. We want to make sure we have sufficient capacity to, to do this cross-linking. Now, a word on AZs. So like I said, we control the placement of the SDBC via this AZ and this subnet. So there's a couple reasons we have this here. So number one, so you can actually control placement. So you can determine what AZ your SDBCs land in. But also, um, you know, anytime you're, you're sending network traffic between AZs and Amazon, you get billed for cross AZ bandwidth charges. And so one of the main purposes of doing this, sticking these in the same AZ is so that we're not incurring bandwidth charges right out of the gate with this cross-link. And so anything in this case that you're, you're talking to in, in this example in AZ1A, you know, no bandwidth charges. Now, if I, if I go through and create additional subnets with things attached to them and I start communicating from the SDC to these new things that are in a different AZ, then I start incurring cross-AZ bandwidth charges. And those bandwidth charges will show up in your Amazon account. So something to keep in mind when you're, you're, you're making these decisions. We, we, we typically recommend to uh, deploy these in an AZ where the bulk of your, um, you know, workloads reside that you know you're going to be, connect, you know, uh, communicating back and forth with frequently. So that concludes this uh, section of the presentation. In later sessions, I will co uh, cover compute and storage as well as uh, the network architecture of the SDBC. And so... Um, keep in mind this cross-linking. This is going to uh, this is going to become important uh, in later sessions as we discuss the network architecture. So again, thanks for watching. Uh, that concludes this session.